Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Costs on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, the reunited kingdom. Scotland will not be an independent country. The United Kingdom will survive. So is it just business as usual from now on, or will Westminster ease its grip like it promised? Also this week, is the International Monetary Fund about to bail out Ghana? And whatever happened to all the country's oil wealth? Plus the online pivot to Asia, the much-hyped Alibaba stock market listing has thrust Jack Ma into the spotlight. We'll look at the man and the challenges in investing in this year's hot tech stock. So in the end, it was just a bridge too far. After all the hype, the surge in the polls, the years of waiting, the Scottish nationalists' quest for independence from the United Kingdom fell short. In its wake, though, a still fractured union, a divided country, and lingering questions over whether Scotland could have supported itself economically. On the night, though, the nerves which the No campaign felt finally gave way to celebration as, vote by vote, it became clear Scottish voters had opted to stay with what they knew rather than what could be. And so the onus now falls on the UK government, a government which, in trying to woo voters over to the No side, made a lot of promises. On behalf of the Scottish Government, I accept the result and I pledge to work constructively in the interests of Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. Secondly, the Unionist parties made vows late in the campaign to devolve more powers to Scotland. Scotland will expect these to be honoured in rapid course. To all those who did vote for independence, we hear you. We now have a chance, a great opportunity, to change the way the British people are governed and change it for the better. To those in Scotland skeptical of the constitutional promises that were made, let me say this. We have delivered on devolution under this government and we will do so again in the next parliament. The three pro-union parties have made commitments, clear commitments, on further powers for the Scottish Parliament. We will ensure that those commitments are honoured in full. Just for the record, this is how it all stacked up in the end. 44.7% of Scottish voters wanted their country to leave the United Kingdom. However, 553 were happy with the status quo. Is that surprising? Probably not. But a few months ago, it was looking like the no vote would get even more than that, which says something about the yes vote's uh, momentum. There was an immediate lift on UK markets and the British pound lifted too, reflecting a, a sort of financial sigh of relief, if you like, that the uncertainty had finally gone. But as Alex Salmon said, what the yes voters will be looking for now are those devolved powers the UK government in Westminster promised during the campaign. Now, at this stage, we usually like to prove or disprove a point with some numbers. In this case, could Scotland's economy survive as an independent nation? Well, the nationalists believe so. They said North Sea oil could finance the economy. But the unionists called into question the amount of oil there and, to say the least, oil revenue is unpredictable. There was also the share of debt Scotland would assume and what it would do for its currency. At best, this was all a lot of guesswork and a lot of uncertainty. Here is someone, though, who's had to explain to her clients what all this has meant, and she's going to do it for us now as well. Joining us from London, Sarah Hewan, who is senior economist at Standard Chartered. Sarah, the no vote got it. What does the yes vote get out of this, though, though? All these promises that were made by Westminster. Yes, I think that um, the yes vote, clearly, the, those who voted yes will be disappointed, but they will have achieved uh, probably some promises for more devolution. So each of the leaders of the main, uh, three main parties in the UK have promised that there will be more autonomy for Scotland, uh, greater, dis, uh, greater powers over uh, decisions on taxation, on welfare spending. Uh, so these are important. Uh, factors that suggest that all is not lost for the yes vote. But is there a sort of, well, a possibility at least for a sort of snowball effect? Because one of the things David Cameron said in his first speech was about English votes for English issues as well. Wales might want something as well. Moving to a more federalist UK. 
I think that one thing that has happened during this campaign is that English uh, voters have become much more aware of uh, the autonomy that Scotland already has. And uh, in the approach to the election, which we'll hold in May of next year, there are going to be increasing pressures on the government to uh, look at the question of what uh, English voters get. And uh, the sense of the need for more autonomy from England, I think, is going to be addressed alongside uh, more powers for Scotland. And the fact that in that general election, this is something maybe you can explain more for our international viewers, is that uh, it is the other party, the opposition party, the Labour Party, which is you know more traditionally in Scotland, and really it, the way it's tracking at the moment isn't looking too strong. So it's really the party which might not do so well actually offers more for Scotland. Yes, the opinion polls are suggesting that Labour is in the lead, but only by a very narrow margin, which is unusual. At this stage in the electoral cycle, you would normally assume the opposition party would be in a stronger position. Uh, so there are questions over exactly what the makeup of the government is going to be after May's election next year. At the same time, the Conservatives are facing a lot of pressure from uh, the UK Independence Party. It's probably the only party mm. which is uh, asking for a, a, an English Parliament, uh, but they are likely to split the right wing vote, which suggests that probably Labour, at the moment, it looks as if the polls suggest Labour will squeeze in. Sarah, you're an economist, so let's talk economics. I'm not asking you to say whether you think yes or no was right, but I'm asking you for your opinion on the argument. The arguments, and I, I mentioned this in the lead up the North Sea oil, the currency, and all of these things, did they stack up in the end, do you think? Well, clearly to the voters they didn't, but do you think as, as an argument it stacked up? The, the, the problem was that there were so many uncertainties. Uh, nothing had been negotiated. Nothing had really been prepared uh, in the event of a yes vote. So it was all up for grabs, essentially. Uh, we hadn't uh, any clarity on whether the uh, um, border would be drawn in terms of North Sea oil and gas. Uh, the currency argument, an incredibly important mm. one, had not begun to be resolved. Um, so I think that... The, for the near term, uh, there would have been a lot of uncertainty, a lot of volatility, and we'd already seen um, market, UK markets suffering as a consequence. A yes vote, certainly near term, would have added to that volatility. Mm. Now, longer term, it's, it, it may well be the case that Scotland could have um, done fine as an independent country. Um, the problem is that long term is still some way away, and I think that we would have seen many years of upheaval which would have been negative for the economy in Scotland and probably for the economy in the, the rest of the UK as well. Do you think, Sarah, the economic argument might have kicked in in the end? I was in Scotland myself about a month ago and I felt the change then. It was around the time of that second debate and you felt the, the emotional change go towards the yes. But in the end, these economic arguments, pensions is another thing we haven't talked about, which would have been so important to a lot of voters. Maybe all of that kicked in at the final uh, hurdle. I think the businesses were initially very reluctant to be aligned, to be seen to be aligned with uh, one side or the other. And so they were probably quite slow in coming forward and laying out the economic costs of independence. Ultimately, of course, a decision like this probably does have to come from the heart. Uh, but uh, many people will have been also looking at their pocketbooks and worrying about the uncertainty that would follow a referendum. Sarah Hewn, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Of course, so much of the economic debate around Scotland's independence was about oil, how much of it is left in the North Sea, and not so much if, but for how long would it sustain an independent Scottish economy. Lawrence Lee filed this report from Aberdeen before the vote on the great oil debate. The Granite City, they call Aberdeen, and on the east coast here, it's often bitterly cold and unremittingly grey. But this place has been basking in the economic sunshine for years that oil has provided. Kenny runs a successful construction company, yet he supports independence from the UK because he thinks so much of the profit has been wasted by London. Oil was discovered in the late 1960s when I was a teenager and ever since I was a teenager they've been saying the oil is running out. So that's stifled development and opportunities. I think we could have had a much, much stronger economy in the northeast of Scotland had the infrastructure investment and encouragement from uh, the UK Treasury been stronger. The two sides in this debate over the future of the United Kingdom agree that Scotland could survive as an independent country. 
But oil, energy and Scotland's future income have been a source of endless, furious debate. It's been absolutely central to the argument of the Scottish National Party that the seas there are still full of oil and that the profits from Scottish oil should go to Scotland and not London. And yet the unionists insist, as they have for many years, that those optimistic forecasts are simply a lie and that the oil's running out. Really, it's all a metaphor for the big question Scotland faces. Is this country, as the unionists say, really quite poor, or as the nationalists insist, really quite rich? One day the oil will run out, that much is certain, but its replacements could be every bit as lucrative. This stretch of water in the far north of Scotland will create the world's biggest tidal energy scheme. There are other similar and very large renewable energy projects throughout. After all, a windy country surrounded by crashing seas looks very profitable indeed. We could be seeing tens of thousands more people employed in these fields and more, much more development of these resources. So I think it's a case of the level, let's see, dependent on the level of our ambitions. Yet many in Scottish business insist nationalist claims of huge wealth are an illusion. No welfare reform, no poor people, no nuclear weapons, our own Army, Navy and Air Force, an expanding NHS, continuing pensions, expanding childcare, you name it, we can have it. The only thing that's not been promised are long hot summers and white Christmases. We can have it all. The nationalist slogan is yes we can. For the unionists it's no we can't. It's all about who the voters believe. And still ahead on Counting the Cost, Alibaba, online, on the stock market, but is it on point? We look at the man and the controversies behind China's e-commerce giant. Right now, though, we're going to look at one of the most stable nations in Africa, Ghana, which, thanks to cocoa and gold and then the discovery of oil, was on course to become one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And then it all went wrong. So wrong, in fact, it had to turn to the International Monetary Fund to help sort out its economic mess. The trouble started when Ghana began spending money before it began pumping oil. Debt, first of all, rose from $9 billion to $23 billion in just three years. And where Ghana had expected to earn as much as $5 billion by 2015, well, it's received less than $900 million between 2010 and 2012. It was all just way overestimated. Then, with all the imports coming in, Ghana's currency tumbled 40%. Inflation rose to almost 14%. It's all meant an economy which was expected to expand 8% in 2013 could only manage 5.5%. Now, if all that just sounds like a bunch of numbers to you, have a look at the effect of them. I'm abutting now with the proof of what Ghana's economic slide is doing to its own people. Daniel Kissy has been in business for 22 years. He and his wife import clothing and shoes from Turkey and China. He makes his money in local currency, the Ghana city, but he has to pay for his goods in US dollars. The city has depreciated by about 40% against the dollar so far this year, and it's having a huge impact on Kissy's business. Yeah, it's affected me dearly, dearly, because I used to change 29,000 for $10,000, and now I'm changing 39000 for 10, 000, the same $10,000. So you, you can imagine. And people are so frustrated that they've even taken to the streets in protest. Everywhere you go, people are talking about the rising cost of living. Fuel has gone up more than 50% so far this year, and the cost of basic goods is also rocketing. In Malata Market in Accra, business is down. The market women say people just aren't spending. It's really affecting us because when they come, the person has planned from the house to buy maybe a one or two. When it comes and the price has changed, she doesn't even buy it at all. The country imports far more than it exports, so there's a massive demand for US dollars. That's depleting the country's foreign currency reserves and putting pressure on the local currency. The government also has a huge public sector wage bill. The country was initially reluctant to seek help from the International Monetary Fund, but one economist says it's the right decision. Well, we have a situation where we have introduced a new pay structure that is consuming 70% of government revenue, for instance. So we don't have much for development expenditure. And then somehow the government maintains a whole array of subsidies, you know. Now, 
it's been argued that that is not efficient. The IMF is going to help them, you know, put in place this array of short-term stabilization measures. But over the long run also, we need to, you know, try and address the, as I said, the weak economic fundamentals. Ghana has traditionally relied on cocoa and gold exports to prop up the economy. But over the past few years, global commodity prices have fallen. Experts say the country needs to diversify and grow its manufacturing sector to boost earnings from exports. In the short term, the government also needs to cut spending, and that's likely to be unpopular. People like Kisi just want things to get better, but it's going to be a difficult journey that requires a lot of political will. Yep, and some smart economic thinking too. Joining us from London to discuss it all is Angus Downey. Uh, he's the head of economic research at the West African bank, Ecobank. Angus, what is the story here? Ghana was looking pretty good there for a while. Has it simply been a case of spending the money before they had it? It looks like that. Well, I think yes in some ways, um, but I don't think everything's broken in the economy. I mean, they've got some quite good uh, indicators that you can talk about and quite strong domestic demand that's ongoing. But yes, I think the root of the problem was that they were spending quite a lot of money at central and local government levels, and also they weren't raising enough tax revenues. So this is what led to these large fiscal deficits. And with that, you also were getting a, um, a large level of current account deficit building up over the last couple of years. And so I think a lot of investors were thinking, well, this doesn't look very sustainable. So that was leading to a lot of currency depreciation. How manageable would you call these debts and deficits? You know, when we've looked at recent cases of debts, most of them have been Europe and most of them have been pretty horrific. Um, how bad would you call Ghana's debts? Are they, as I say, are they manageable? Um, well, they've managed thus far, but it's not something that can be sustained indefinitely. When you've got a fiscal deficit of around 9% of GDP, which it currently is at the moment, that's come down slightly. It was at probably close to 12% um, about 18 months ago. And really anything that's over 5% of GDP, you've got to think, well, how is the government going to work its way out of this position. Mm -hmm. So it needs a strategy. It takes several years to get out of uh, a hole that you've dug yourself into of that magnitude of around 5% of GDP as a rule of thumb. So when you're at 10, 11, 12% of GDP, then you know that really is a big problem. And I think you know all the, the factors that have driven the, the government to talk to the IMF and mm. agree on trying to arrive at a solution have really been the result of this unsustainability of the, the fiscal position. Well, I'm glad you brought up the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, because that was going to be my next question. You know, what could happen there? You kind of always feel that the International Monetary Fund is this bank of last resort. It's, you know, when things need fixing immediately, not necessarily an answer to problems. Um, I would disagree in some ways, because I think, yes, it's, it's kind of a last resort that Ghana's had to engage with the IMF because if we cast our mind back to March or April this year, there was talk about a domestic uh, reform agenda being created within government. We never really saw much detail off that and many of the indicators continued to deteriorate, including the exchange rate. So that led the government to engage with the IMF formally and I think at, at the moment we have an IMF mission in Accra talking to the government, identifying what are some of the, the main issues that have to be corrected and what are the corrections that need to be put in place. But I think the IMF has got a longer term role. They're not just firefighters coming in looking to put out the flames and then they leave again. Mm. And you've got to also remember that the IMF have got a resident representative based in Accra. He's been there a number of years. But, but also that there is ongoing technical assistance provided by the IMF through its various departments, fiscal affairs, monetary and capital markets, and so on. And that engagement is long term, and that will continue even after this current program of support and help that the IMF are looking to provide ends. So I think really the, the IMF is a long-term partner. It's there to help its member countries, and this shouldn't be seen as a short-term palliative. It's more part of a longer-term perspective and strategy to help the, the Ghanaian authorities move forward and continue to, to grow the economy in a sustainable way and achieve this higher level of middle-income status that they recently got to. Angus, I believe you were previously with uh, the Africa Development Bank, and I wonder 
given that previous role. If you could give us a bit more insight into Ghana. It is not a country which we hear an awful lot about. So I'm keen to understand about, you know, things like the infrastructure, the, the roads and the infrastructure, the hospitals, the healthcare, all these sorts of things which need to be looked after and are central to a country's growth. Absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, without infrastructure, you can't really function as an economy. Um, and you need it at both the basic level, roads, port facilities, airports, railways, which Ghana has. But also you need up-to-date new technology in, the t in with regard to telecoms, for example. Um, and Ghana has got quite a lot of that when you compare it to some of the other countries within Africa. But I think there's this infrastructure deficit, and we've heard a lot about that, not just in Ghana, but also elsewhere on the continent. And I think the World Bank reckons somewhere around nearly $100 billion per year is mm. required to bridge that deficit gap. So $100 billion per year is needed to provide new infrastructure as well as rehabilitate existing infrastructure across the continent. When we look at Ghana specifically, it probably could do with something in the region of you know, 8 to 10 billion alone because it's quite a large population, a relatively large country. And you know, the road infrastructure, whilst it's relatively good compared to some of its, its peers mm. on the continent, there could be improvements ac across the board, not only just on roads, but also transport infrastructure as well as telecoms and access to the internet and so forth. So infrastructure is hugely important and it's one part of helping to create the, the correct economic environment that allows the private sector to flourish, consumers to buy goods and services. And so without that infrastructure in place, you're really, you're, you're going to always struggle. All right, Angus Downey talking Ghana with us this week. Thank you for your time, Angus. Finally this week, the most anticipated stock market listing of the year, Alibaba, the Chinese market website which raised almost $22 billion. It's now one of four Asian internet giants to dominate the top ten. But what about the man behind the company, the one seen as Beijing's guy, the one who's attempted to still maintain control of the company post-float? Adrian Brown looks at all that. Alibaba has come a long way very quickly. This necktie manufacturer is one of 10 million clients using the online listing service. It connects small and medium-sized businesses to domestic and global buyers. The customers can buy our product um, in like five minutes in everyone, uh, everywhere in the world and uh, they can check our products in, in one page, web page. Hello, I'm Jack Ma, founder and chairman of Alibaba Group. Jack Ma is barely known outside China, but within the country, he's attained almost cult-like status. A billionaire with close links to the Communist Party. Analysts say the country's strictly controlled internet means Ma has to tread carefully. Uh, Jack understands very well that uh, his position depends on maintaining very strong government relations uh, and then if he moves off in a direction that's, that's too far away from what the government wants, uh, he could see things change very quickly. Another challenge for Alibaba, rampant counterfeiting. Fakes have appeared on his shopping website Taobao, only recently removed from the US government's list of notorious markets. Many call Ma a visionary, but one with authoritarian tendencies, say others. I think he's like a dictator. Alibaba is like a typical Chinese company, and uh, Jack Ma is like the only boss. Ma's offering investors a slice of the world's fastest growing internet market, more than 600 million users. They'll be caution, though. Alibaba tried to float on the Hong Kong exchange seven years ago, but the shares ended up being brought back by the company after losing much of their value. Ahead of this flotation, Jack Ma outlined his priorities for Alibaba. Customers come first, employees second, and shareholders third. A very different business model from many in the West. The challenge now will be for that vision to succeed once the company is globally owned. Adrian Brown, Al Jazeera, in Hongzhou. 
And that's our show for this week. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash programs. You click through to the Counting the Cost page, which has more in-depth reports and interviews for you, as well as down the side, you see the social media feed, which you can uh, chime in with your views. To do that, you can tweet either me at Kamal AJE. There's also our business editor at Abid Oliver Ali. And don't forget to use the hashtag Counting the Cost as well. Or just drop us an email. Counting the Cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. Thank you.